Tell us this is the first summit in three years. What led up to China and Japan actually agreeing to this and to restart mutual visits with their foreign ministers? Well, I think that both of the bilateral relationships have been strained over the last several years, and there's a sense on both sides in both of the two legs, the Korea-Japan and also on the Japan-China, that it was really time to put some of those issues behind, uh, behind the parties. On the Korea-Japan side, things have really been sour since President Park's inauguration in early 2013, primarily on the history issue. And similarly, on the Japan-China side, the uh, election of Abe you know, came in the wake of some strains over the Senkaku Islands, in particular, that had soured relations there. So I think it was partly just these issues had festered for too long, and there, there's too much of importance that the three parties need to discuss to allow them to continue. What was at stake if they didn't come together, Stephen? I don't think there's anything catastrophic that would have happened. It's really just foregone opportunities. These are the three most important actors in Northeast Asia. There are a number of common interests from North Korea to cyber to economics in particular, which we can talk about. And I, I think that with uh, China slowing a little bit, Japan still in an economic rut, the economics might have played a role in, in trying to push cooperation back onto track. Will we see any immediate impact of restoring trade and security ties? I think the biggest uh, piece of this is actually the meetings which are going to take place tomorrow between Korea and Japan, the leaders of those two countries. The United States has been extremely frustrated with the fact that these two have not even communicated you know, since, uh, since President Park's inauguration. So that's hindered cooperation on the two of them with the United States as well. So there are big stakes in getting that bilateral relationship back on track. Let's talk a little bit about the tensions surrounding the three of them uh, and how that played off one another. Sure. Okay, so let's start with the Japan-China. Back in 2010, in September, there was an episode around the Senkaku Islands, which the Chinese called the Diaoyus, uh, in which a uh, Chinese trawler uh, ended up ramming a Japanese Coast Guard vessel. And that created a tremendous amount of tension at that time, and there was a belief that the Chinese had manipulated uh, trade relations in order to get the captain's release. And then two years later, the government actually purchased those islands from the private party that had held them. And this was seen as, as violating China's territorial integrity because it has a claim to those islands. On the bilateral front between Japan and Korea, the issue really has to do with history more than anything current. Um, Japan had been involved in uh, the use of, of prostitutes during the war, the mobilization of Korean women for prostitution to serve as Japanese troops. Obviously, this is an extremely sensitive issue. And the belief on the Korean side is that the Abe administration had just not been forthcoming enough in apologizing and offering compensation for the damage that had been done to these women. Do you expect us to have more, uh, more talks in the coming years? Stephen. Yeah, yeah, I mean, this is one of those issues where it's not a headline grabber. You know, the talks are going to generate more talks. But I do think that one of the things on the economic side, which is important both for the U.S. and the countries in the region, is the possible conclusion of a three-way uh, free trade agreement between the three countries. So these are very large economies. And we have the TPP, as you know, which has just been recently concluded. I think China would like to have its set of trade relations pushed forward with countries in the region. And they're working on a larger agreement between 16 countries centered on ASEAN. But clearly, the three of them, uh, China, Japan, Korea, could lead that process if they could reach a free trade agreement among themselves. That would be groundbreaking. Thank you so much, Stephen Hager, joining us from San Diego. We appreciate it. My pleasure.